We've got John Wolf and Brad Nelson ready to go. Uh, as you can see, Azorius cycling in the hands of John Wolf on the other side, four color mid range, similar to what we just saw from Mangucci. Paul, what's the deal with this Azorius cycling deck? So, what it essentially is is that it, it's a blue white control deck. It's got it's got counter spells and a bunch of cycling cards that are also counter spells, and ultimately, it's trying to win off the back of Drake Haven, which is a, a limited superstar. But it's it's trying to win off of Drake Haven, card advantage provided by Abandoned Sarcophagus, or through. Teferi Hero of Dominia or Shark Typhoon. But at the mm. end of the day, what it basically is, is just a blue-white control deck, but it's got it's so many of its cards have cycling, John Rolfe has actually chosen to put in two copies of Abandoned Sarcophagus to get additional value off those cards in the late game. All right, here's a thought seize to kick things off for Nelson after he's played the, um, the Growth Spiral there. And he's taking a look at Neutralize, which is going to hit the bin. But plenty of action left over here for John Rolfe, although it might take, take a little while to get there. He's got a pair of Hieroglyphic Illumination, and interestingly, it looks like, at least thus far, he's uh, patient. He's going to try to cast them for full value, get both cards out of it rather than the cycling. Yeah, John Rolfe is well aware that this is kind of a grindy matchup, and mm. so any opportunity that he can kind of get a two-for-one will allow him to kind of be ahead on cards and just make it so that he can kind of keep up with all the cards, all the card advantage cards that you get out of the four color mid range deck. So it looks like he's going to just be waiting to hard cast the, these illuminations to just, again, just kind of get to that late game, find lands, find counter spells. And, uh, you know, what Brad, Brad's deck certainly doesn't put on a ton of pressure. So opportunity for uh, a seal away there, though it looks like John's content to just fire off the illumination here on end step. More mana efficient, and he can only take he only takes two damage in the meantime. Oh, Paul, you know what I'm thinking, bud? <laughs> Got a couple of sharks. I'm just saying, like, <laughs> I'm thinking. I mean, it. You know, Brad Nelson's deck has what two Maelstrom pulses tops to be able to deal with the Shark Typhoon. Yeah. The only problem is it is a complete disaster if Brad Nelson does have a Maelstrom pulse, right? Because you've tapped out and you just slammed this enchantment. So, I, I'm not sure if we're gonna see it. Also, it's pretty tempting to just go end of turn cycle Shark Typhoon for three so that you have a nice blocker for these Hydra crises that are on the battlefield. So that's probably what he's going to be going for here instead. I mean, it's tempting if you're a coward. <laughs> <laughs> also, I mean, John I'm is looking. at 14. I'm looking. Okay. Now I'm looking for Maelstrom Pulse. I'm not seeing any here. Yeah, if if John uh, and remember these are open deck, deck, maybe he'll be more confident slamming down the shark typhoon. I guess he is under quite a bit of pressure here, though. You, you're not wrong, Paul, about that part of it. <laughs> Might need to do something this turn rather than draw a few more cards. All right, there it is. Shark typhoon is going to get cycled, so that's x equals three. Although he did take a couple of hits there in the air as a result. I wonder if Brad's just going to run out this fatal push when the when he has a window to, because mm -hmm. John doesn't have access to counter magic right now. You know what you can't fatal push? An enchantment. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's exactly right, Paul. All right. Well, I, I'm sure we'll see this shark typhoon gobble up something. There's also the chance for for seal away to become a factor here as well with six mana. Uh, John has some really good options with using up all of that mana on like seal away plus illumination, for example. Yeah, no, that's, that seems to be the safest play here because if Brad does have another removal spell, he's just going to take eight damage this turn. So I think sealing away the Yasharn into illumination just sets him out beautifully here. By the way, chats with me. They are demanding at this chats point with in John Marshall. <laughs> of course. I'm just if, saying. If the play is always cast the most expensive card that <laughs> has high risk, high reward, chat's going to go with that line. Uh, you, you just kind of described my play style. <laughs> One very succinct sentence there. Just jam. All right. Well, it looks like John's going to pass the turn back once again. He's drawing cast out as well, which could give him potentially a good answer. And we're going to see an unconventional play here, Paul. Look at this. Ether Gust, my own 
hydrate crisis. Yeah, now the question is, is John gonna respond by casting out that hydrate crisis in response? Probably, right? I mean, it's yeah. an interesting play because Ethergus isn't gonna find any targets on John Wolf's side of the battlefield here. But if, if and so if that's the case, what card would you want to draw more than any other if you were Brad? Well, Crisis is on the list. It's probably, you know, number one or number two. But there yeah. it is, cast out to gobble up that Crisis, take it off the battlefield and prevent that line of play. Yeah, and Brad really wants something like an Uro here off the top or a Hydra Crisis. Instead, he's going to have to settle for Thoughtseize, which... Isn't going to do a whole ton here. He can take away the Typhoon or, or the Illumination. And it looks like John has says, okay, you can, you can pick one or the other. And it's going to be Shark Typhoon. Brad's probably thinking, well, I don't want him to hard cast that. So I'll right. just uh, take that away. Here comes the Irrigated Farmland on the cycle. And basically what we're looking for here from John Wolf is one of his finishers. And there it is. There Drake it came is. in off the top of the library. Thank you, John's deck, for cooperating with my commentary there. That worked out beautifully. So this is a, a, an engine, basically, that John can put together where whenever he cycles or discards a card, he can pay one and make a 2-2 two, two Flying Drake. And basically, his deck can do this perpetually from this point most of the time, uh, usually multiple times a turn as well, where it can be you know two or three mana per Drake, roughly. And uh, that's going to be extremely difficult to outpace if Brad cannot wow. find any way to get ahead. And he can't. He's going to just scoop him up. The classic Brad Nelson scoop there. He, when he knows he's going to lose, he's done. He wants to get yeah. to that sideboarding. And that's exactly what we see here from Brad. Yeah. And, you know, I think this was a, a fairly clever deck selection here. If you expect a lot of these kind of Sultai mid range strategies or four color mid range strategies coming in, they really don't have a lot of answers to enchantments and artifacts, right? They only mm -hmm. usually play one or two Maelstrom pulses or, or two, one or two Mythoses. And if that's the case, if you rely on your win condition being an enchantment or an artif artifact, that's going to go a long way because they just simply don't have enough answers to deal with those threats. We already saw that with Kowalski's deck where he basically locked out Reed Duke with, with the, uh, the three card splinter twin combo as he pulled it, as he called it with the Gideon's yeah. in, 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 intervention with the nine lives and the solemnity effectively just preventing the salt decks from actually just doing any damage whatsoever. So here, right. same thing with John Rolf with the Drake Havens and I guess potentially the hard cash shark typhoons, Marshall, uh, <laughs> you, you could rely on some of those cards uh, yeah. as potential win conditions in this matchup. Yeah, John, it's interesting because this cycling deck manages to be very narrow in the sense that almost every card has cycling or cares about cycling outside of a few exceptions, uh, you know, mainly to fairy, but it also can hit you from different angles, right? We've seen, we know that to fairy hero of dominaria can win a game all by itself, literally, right? It can be your entire win condition where you, you know, get it, get it up to high enough to ultimate, but keep it around then take out all your opponent's permanents and then eventually deck them. That's a thing that can happen. Um, and then as we mentioned, you know, you could hard cast a shark typhoon or even just win off of a couple of big sharks that are left over. And then, but the main thing that you do, of course, is, is try to hit that Drake Haven that we saw there and flood the board with the two twos. You know, for a relatively narrow minded deck, right? This is a deck that's really trying to do one thing, cycle a whole bunch of cards. That's a lot of ways to win the game. Yeah, definitely. Now, things do get a lot closer after sideboard, and this is what you just kind of see all the time when you do see a deck with Thoughtseize or a mid-range deck with Thoughtseize and removal spells going up against a control deck. Typically, the control deck will have the edge game one because those removal spells don't really do anything. But once once Brad also can now sideboard in Thoughtseizes in conjunction with some counter magic and remove all of his dead removal spells, all of a sudden he can now set up set set himself up better to to resolve those those Nissas or, or Narsets uh, after board to to try to get an edge back. A mulligan here from Brad Nelson leaves him with not a great hand. The good news for Brad, though, is that John didn't keep an amazing hand either. It was all lands and abandoned sarcophagus. He's now found neutralized off the top, but not a whole lot going on here just yet. Well, there's a sensor that could be a card. Yeah, I mean, John's hand looks 
totally fine for the time being. Yeah, I found a couple of counters and can set up with a sarcoph sarcophagus for a, a good late game. Yeah, and it might look like he just has all lands, but he has plenty to do with those lands, right? He can, not only can he censor something here potentially, but he can cycle the farmland. Uh, and also he's got that Castle Ardenvale to slowly start pumping out 1-1s in the late game. All right, land number three hits the battlefield in a second copy of Sensor. So things have shaped up beautifully here for John Wolf. Here comes Uro. We and saw uh, Brad decline to play it last turn, but this time he is. Uh, people really hate getting censored. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> really, no, hate it. really heads up play. He knows this matchup isn't going, it is not very quick. You can be a little patient. And somebody of Brad Nelson's caliber is certainly not going to run into uh, a sensor in that spot, especially if he can afford to. Look at all this cycling. Yeah, and what you're probably going to see here is Brad Nelson just try to put himself in a situation here where he can get up to potentially six mana here, mm -hmm. get to six mana, then go for the escape with the Uro and have the negate backup, or also just potentially look for a Thoughtseize. And given the way that Brad's playing, it may be time for John to just start cycling sensors here uh, if, if Brad's never going to give him the window anyway. And now his mana advantage has really started to uh, accrue. Now, one thing to keep in mind is there is Drake Haven in hand, and he may want to keep any cycling cards that he can get his hands on here so that he can trigger Drake Haven as many times as possible. Because one thing that you will see as well is that in hands like this, where John doesn't have any way to draw extra cards, he's kind of all in on that sarcophagus to get him the advantage in the late game. Now, it does an amazing job at that. That's the good news. Yeah. It would have been pretty tempting to at least cycle one of the sensors, given that you have two copies in hand. Mm -hmm. Also, if you cycle the one, maybe your opponent won't play around the second one because it's less likely that you have one. They never play against two, you know. <laughs> oh, there's the thought sees now from Brad Nelson. But he's going to see a pretty well-ranged hand here. And it looks like John wants to protect it. The abandoned sarcophagus, again, it really is an absolute engine in the later part of the game, allowing you to get a ton of advantage off of basically every spell in your deck because they pretty much all have cycling. And that can be really difficult to overcome in these attrition fights like how you described it, Paul. Yeah. So this is really interesting here. So now Brad Nelson is going to be able to play a Narset and keep up Negate. But this now also opens the window for John to resolve one of his powerful three mana ench enchantment or artifacts that he has in hand with sensor backup. Okay. So Narset Parter of Veils could definitely make things difficult or at least awkward for John. Yeah. Like, it still counts as cycling even if you don't draw the card, right? <laughs> so that won't affect the Drake Haven, but he'll just run out of gas too quickly. Yeah. The nice thing is John can always at least cycle a card on Brad's turn. Mm -hmm. So... so if he does want to go through cards, he won't be able to do multiple cycles in one turn, but he can still get the one off. So Narset, it's good, but it's not quite as backbreaking as it would be against, for example, the mirror, where all of a sudden you can't you can't cast your your main phase uh, Uros or your Hydra Crisis don't draw you any cards. I mean, it seems to me that John just kind of needs to go for it here. He, there is an active Narset on the uh, on the board, and this just seems like the best opportunity to try to resolve either the sarcophagus or the Drake Haven. And now you know Brad wants to negate this, but he's also very well aware of sensor being uh, being a thing, but. 
Yeah, may feel forced to do so and does. Wow. Oh. Okay, so John's playing some some five brain stuff here because like the, he didn't even bother. Oh. It's because he knows about the Nissa, and it's more important for him to make sure that he has a counter to Nissa. Uh, and he could have got Dovin's veto in hand. He wants to make sure that he has that up to counter the Nissa. So he did not want to go for that counter war, despite it being so tempting. Censoring anything, right? Feels so great, but uh, choosing to be a little more patient there and have I the wonder, veto for the Nissa. So now does he finally abandon the censor plan? No, nope, <laughs> he wants to keep him for the Drake Haven. That that does seem to be the case here. Yeah, and now he can he can go for the Drake Haven here. He can go for the Drake Haven, have Veto backup, and then start cycling away these sensors. And and now with this Haven on the battlefield, this this is going to put some extra pressure on Brad and Brad's going to probably just start getting a little more aggressive here and, and and try to put some more permanence onto the battlefield because this Drake Haven can run away with the game. That's right. And, and we really have kind of lined this up now as this is what matters, right? Like it's, it's about Drake Haven versus all of the stuff that Brad can throw at it. And if you look at the way the game's played out, I mean, Brad has a loaded hand here. Yeah, and Brad really wishes he had one more mana source here. I guess it doesn't matter because of the multiple sensors, but can't really run out the Nissa this turn, even if he gets this Dovin's Veto out of his hand. Uh, alternatively, he could consider just taking a sensor. I mean, you're taking away a 2-2 flyer that draws you a card, and he does have Uro in his graveyard, although unclear how many cards Brad currently has in sideboard, but... Um, if he takes one of the sensors and he has enough cards to escape the Uro, um, he will be able to play, pay for the one sensor that John would have left in his hand. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, that, I mean, that would be a huge turn. And he did. He took away the sensor there. Now, if you pay attention, though, the Drake Haven does say <laughs> right. anytime you discard a card. So it would actually trigger. And uh, yeah, there's a Drake. Thank you very much. Now, he didn't get the card out of it, so it does matter. But Right. And again, Brad really wants to close out this game as quickly as possible because the longer this game goes, the the, the more this Drake Haven is just going to continue providing John Rolfe with an advantage. Now, the interesting thing about taking the sensor, of course, is that it does mean that Dovin's veto stays in hand and that kind of traps Nissa in hand. Now, there's a good argument though that you were making that, hey, this is Uro. <laughs> like, okay, fine, I'll hold this Nissa in my hand. You know what else wins me the game? Uro. So very difficult situation here for John Rolfe. Now, he it does have Drake Haven going though, and there's another, and, and we'll be able to generate a big advantage off of it. And we're just gonna see two decks doing what they're designed to do and just smash into each other with who can generate the most advantage in the shortest period of time. Yeah. Now, for Brad, he does have that thought season in hand, so he will be able to resolve that Nissa as he will be able to thought season away the Dovin's veto. And, you know, that might be enough. So this is really on what John can find here off the top to kind of get going because he does have the Drake Haven, but he might need a little bit more. Yeah, and you know, the other card that I'm looking at here, oh, hello, cast wow. out off the top, okay. That was big. Now he can just slam the cast out, get that Uro off the battlefield, and all of a sudden, I mean, he's got the answer. Oh, he doesn't have the answer. He thinks he has the answer in Dovin's veto for the Nissa. So that that was that that was at least one step in the right direction here for John Rolfe to, to kind of get back into this. Yeah, at least from his perspective, of course, right. the Narset is also really posing an annoyance here for John as, you know, some of the cards that he'd like to draw at this point are cards that do get him ahead where he has infinite stuff to cycle, and he has not been able to do that. But as you mentioned, Paul, this thought seize was critical here for Brad because it forces the issue on Dovin's veto, uh, in this case, allowing Brad to uh, take it away. Now, it will generate another Drake, as we mentioned before, but now that could clear the way for Nissa, who shakes the world. And 
this feels like it's going to be very difficult to overcome here for John at this point. Yeah, because John has the ability to make a 2-2 two -two every turn, but Brad's making a 3-3 three -three every turn, and he's got basically, he basically doubled up his mana, and he has an eliminate to kind of make combat pretty tricky as well for double blocks. Right, and you know, because at this point in the game, you're if you're John, you're supposed to make multiple 2-2s two -twos per turn from this point on. I, you, you know, you're supposed to draw your card, cycle a sensor, make a 2-2, two -two, find an illumination, draw a couple of cards, do another cycle. And that's not going to happen with Narset on the battlefield. It really limits what John can do in a pretty meaningful way. And maybe he'll find a way to get it dead. Right now he has two drakes versus the shark and could just send them in. But the pressure's really mounting from Brad at this point with just damage. I mean, he's just, I mean, he's got seven power right now and things are starting to get very shaky here for John. Yeah, John really needs to find an answer for that Nyssa that's in play. Currently won't have enough flyers to be able to attack it down here. So the good news here for John is that Brad isn't really close to escaping Uro a second time for mm -hmm. the time being. So he does have a little bit of time there. Mm -hmm. At least he knows what he needs to beat. And to be fair, since the cards that he needs to beat are both Planeswalkers, if he is able to leverage the Drake Haven, it gives you two, two flyers. Those are usually quite good at managing Planeswalkers. But right now, he's going to take three here, most likely, because he'd like to try to get rid of a Planeswalker by sacrificing one of his Drakes next turn if he can. It's not going to work, I don't think, depending on how things go, because Brad has Eliminate in hand, though, of course, John is really incentivized to cycle the sensor at this point. Yeah, so what John's thinking about here, he knows that it's extremely likely if he cycles and makes a 2-2, he can triple block the land here and get it mm -hmm. off the battlefield. The thing that he's really concerned about is just making sure that Brad can't actually escape the Uro. So that's why you keep seeing him hover over Brad's graveyard, because if he does triple block the land, boom, that puts an extra land into the battlefield, getting Brad even one step closer for that Uro. But um, it looks like he, just, he, do, he does want to shut off you know, two sources of mana that Brad's going to have here and just kind of hoping for the best that Brad can't chain together enough spells to be able to escape Uro this turn or potentially next turn. And, you know, he may be able to, uh, of course, the, the deck that Brad's piloting, the four-color mid-range deck, primarily Sultai colored is very good at putting cards in the yard. And we just saw three cards go to the graveyard at the end of the turn there for Brad. All right. That's, that's, that's a very interesting draw. So now we're talking about Brad being able to make a 3-3 three, three every turn. How about two two twos? Right, and this doesn't care as much about the card draw aspect. So very interesting. This this could be a way for John to start piloting himself back into the match. Now, this is going to make it tough. Here's Uro, Titan of Nature's Wrath. You know, the real issue for John is even if he's able to make a bunch of drakes over the next couple of turn cycles, it's going to be very difficult for him to overcome all of the things that Brad has thrown at him. Two Planeswalkers and Uro and the 4-4 Flying Shark is just a lot. Yeah, but... He, he will have the ability here. He's probably going to take four. He will have the ability to cycle, make two two twos, and then have three flyers to kind of put in front of the Euro. Mm -hmm. And so that'll, again, stall that. And then if he can chain together some other relevant spells in, addition, in conjunction with some cyclers, maybe then he can put together something to get rid of the Nissa on the battlefield. So I think John still has a chance, but... Uh, a lot of it will, will will depend on what he can find off this cycle and his next draw step. I'm actually kind of a fan of this deck that John's got here. There's some neat stuff going on, right? Like, the, you know, cast out on Uro is really cool too. It didn't, there was a second copy for Brad, so he was able to bring it back. But, you know, Finding ways to manage some of the best cards in the format that also fit into your strategy can be very difficult. And, you know, cast out's just beautiful. Yeah. For that. And, and I really like what Brad's doing right now. He knows that, again, two Drake Havens could potentially be problematic. I need to close the door as quickly as possible here, play the second copy of Nissa, just put more pressure on the battlefield. Additionally, by playing the second copy of Nissa, that's an extra card for Uro. So. Brad does want to end this game as soon as possible. Okay, here it is. Pay one and then pay another one. And he will get the card. And see, this is the issue, right? Here, 
here's just the awkwardness that he's facing down. He's got hieroglyphic illumination and he can use it, but he's not getting cards off of it. Neither the cycle, if he does it on his turn, nor the draw two, no matter which. So Narset is just a pain. Yeah, he can. So it looks like he's going for the triple block here, and then he can get that Narset off the battlefield next turn uh, by simply attacking with one of his tokens. Yeah, th you but know, this is a way. Him. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he needs to go big with the Drake Haven. Basically, he'll probably need to just cycle the illumination. Okay, that changes things a little bit. Yeah, first things oh, first, though, yeah. the Narset. Yeah, so now you kill the Narset with right. the secluded step and the illumination. All of a sudden, we're looking at two, uh, four 2-2 two, two flyers here for John Ralph. Yes, and and depending on what he finds with secluded step, it could be even more, you know, right. for, I mean... He could have six or eight of them. I, I don't know if he could quite pay for to get uh, the full amount, but he can get four right now. And then he could, if he finds a land in there, he could get one or two more depending on how it goes. But still, that's going to add up very, very quickly. And he could yeah. just pass the turn here. He decides not to do it right away either way. This deck plays at instant speed because of cycling really all the time anyway. Yeah, perhaps he's concerned about a card like Maelstrom Pulse. Imagine making all your tokens on your main phase, and then all of a sudden Brad just goes Maelstrom Pulse all your tokens away and then attack you for lethal. So Oof, yeah, just waiting to tough. do it at instant speed. That That is pretty rough, yeah. Although I still, I don't know if Brad actually has Maelstrom Pulse, like anywhere. Oh, right, because he's playing the Soul Tide, uh, the four color version. So yeah. typically the four color version will play the Mythos. Yeah, if he, if he has it at all. He does not have pulse anywhere in the in the 75 okay so he won't so that's something that john and, right. and let's remind the viewers that you know the the players will have deck lists and they'll be studying them as they play their match okay but everything's coming in this is still a heck of a lot of pressure Ooh, wow Ooh, increases too so let's see if he hits another cycler off of this because that could get him one additional drake no, it was That's Dovin's do it. Veto. He's at 10 life. And it looks like he's going to go to one and double block two lands. Yeah. Yikes. You know, he looks I like think maybe he wants, Yeah, you want to get rid of the forest to prevent Hydro Crisis or, and also just shut off uh, as much as you can the static ability on Nissa Who Shakes the World. This is a good block. You know, he survives it. He makes good trades, one Drake for one land, and he, he'll be left with the two Drakes uh, as well as the third one that it attacked. But boy, it's getting... He's down to one life here. Right, and he's also out of cyclers, right? He doesn't have a way he to is. keep that even going currently, so... You're right. And it looks like before Brad Nelson's creatures are going to die, he's going to float the mana to cycle Shark Typhoon here. And keeping up the Triome in case he draws something like a Negate. Fatal Push or something? Yeah, Fatal Push, Negate, any, any, any interactive spell there. Okay, down to one goes John Wolf. He's up a game here, so he has a little bit of wiggle room. But Brad Nelson... This deck in the late game has given him all he can handle. And let's see if he can draw something here. It looks like he's also got Castle Ardenvale as well as Castle Vantress. Ooh. Oh, but it was an island off the oh, man. And so he's with... not dead. Mm -hmm. He right. can make a 1-1 one, one and chump everything. Yep. But that's basically it. Yes, he has to he has to chump block of the known creatures, <laughs> all four of them. There will be one from Nissa. <laughs> right. And and Brad's uh, gonna be able to get an attack in, draw a card off Uro, and also play a gigantic Hydra Crisis. So I think we're gonna see a game three here. Does seem to be the case. Really fun, by the way, to get a chance to see these decks just throw everything they have at each other. Like, okay, I'll get 
I'll get Nissa and Uro, and I'll give you two Drake Havens. Let's see what happens. <laughs> and uh, in this case, even though it's actually fairly close, it does look like at this point it's just simply too much for uh, John Wolf to handle as he's going to have to desperately chump block all of these creatures here. And it's hard to imagine what he could come up with. Uh, we did see Settle the Wreckage in the main deck. I don't know if he kept it in. Probably Maybe not. that's something that could keep him alive if he still has it. Yeah, just really, really tough spot here for Wolf. And even then, uh, if that were to be the case, it, it would be hard to imagine that he could survive um, the next turn after that anyway. Yeah, and, and this is just kind of an example of how the matchup just kind of um, turns around a bit, especially after sideboard, because all of a sudden now Brad did have his own counter spells to fight, fight back. Um, have shark typhoons to be able to put out threats at instant speed and kind of force the action from John Rolfe. Whereas before, Brad had to try to just slam really expensive cards and hope all of them just cope one of them eventually resolve. But now you can go end of turn shark typhoon. If you can't deal with this, it's going to win the game. If you do, it's going to be able to tax your mana in, a, in an awkward way, and then I can try to resolve something else. Here's Narset. So Minus two. Wrath of God? I don't yeah. know if he kept any of those in. Yeah. that. And and even then, yeah, you know you're in such bad position there. It's going to be neutralized going into the hand, which would provide two blockers thanks to the cycling ability. But uh, it looks like not enough left in the tank here, and that is going to be game number two going to the bard Brad Nelson. He's going to pick up game number two as they go to sideboards. Let's see, there's three rafts in the board there, and the one settle the wreckage there too. So yeah. None of that available uh, in game number two there for John. Yeah, it looks like both players are basically boarding at most of the removal. But I see a cry of the Carnarium. Brad trying to get a little tricky mm. there. Mm. It does kill all the Drake Havens. That, that is basically his version of Maelstrom Pulse, I guess. Yeah, and, and it doesn't kill many of Brad's creatures. So that's, that's kind of interesting. And Yasharn isn't especially good in this matchup. Mm -hmm. You never want to draw more than one because you only do have the one planes. So, all right. Well, it looks like Brad's content to just run it back. Let's see if there's any tweaks made here. Real original name there, John. He named his deck Historic. <laughs> <laughs> That's oh, probably right. just so that it stands out, you know, like, because he probably has a bunch of decks saved and like, that if you just name it that, then that's the only one for the tournament. You're submitting that one. You keep it simple. I've seen players do that. Right. Okay, game number three incoming between John Rolfe and Brad Nelson. These players are 2-0 and to start things off for the day, and they would love to keep that nice undefeated record going into the standard rounds, which will be coming up right after this, this uh this is the last round of Historic for today. And what are we looking at here? You see the sensor in hand there, as well as Dovin's Veto, Mystical Dispute, a pair of big Teferis in a hollowed fountain. And on the other side, first card I always look for is Thoughtseize, and I see one. Looks so like he Brad. drew that. Yeah, mm. he kept, uh, I, I believe it was five lands, Shark, Typhoon, Uro, which okay. in this matchup, it's really important to be able to kind of hit your land drops. Uh, especially early because the person who has access to more mana can then start navigating around the various counter spells that your opponents can have. So it is really important. And, um, you know, I did mention Shark Typhoon being a very important card of this matchup as well. So John, on the other hand, really needs to find some lands. I wonder if Brad's going to just get a little cheeky here and just take that sensor to make it so that, first of all, he doesn't have to play around it. But secondly, um, maybe try to stall John's mana progression here by kind of prevent uh, taking a draw away from him. <laughs> yep. He did. Brad's got some sweet plays with those, uh, with what he takes away with the, the thought seasons. I like it. Now, also interesting to note here, right, Paul, are the two copies of Teferi, right? That's a big hitter. That's a type of card that can generate a huge advantage over the course of the game. It can even be a win condition on its own. And it's one we didn't see in the last game. It, Teferi did not show up and, and have an effect. 
if John can just kind of cruise up to Teferi here of Dominaria, that could be enough. Oh, absolutely. And I wonder, I think John's probably going to take a draw here, but then probably will have to main phase cycle. Oh, all right, Ooh. never mind. Playing it a little patient. I'm trying to think about the various creatures that Brad might play that would be scary there, right? Because you really want to hit your land drops. Yes. Oh, excuse and... me, a cycling cost, cycling is two. Thought, mm -hmm. thought, thought it was one, so that would be Oh, awesome. oh, sure, sure, yeah. yeah. So that makes more sense. Yeah, John really wanted to leave up the ability to counter something with Neutralize or cast a Dovin's Veto if needed and couldn't do both. Uh, it's gonna be Shark Typhoon, which John will oh, have known that was coming. Typhoon. This is just the, 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 the shark show. It is, and you know what? Might actually just win here. This is not something that John can interact with. These Dovin's Vetoes and even the Neutralizer just rotting in hand. And instead, he just has to sit here and watch Brad go Shark Typhoon, Shark Typhoon, Shark Typhoon, and then try to clean up that mess. While Brad's not losing card advantage now, you know, one way you could do it is to fight sharks with sharks. But as we can see, the mana advantage is, is for Brad Nelson here. Yeah, absolutely. I, and the thing is, I, I don't even, I mean, it's going to be tough for, for John to just even beat a 2-2, two, two, a 3-3, three, three, then a 4-4 four, four shark. Because now, I mean, even just slamming Teferi is not going to get it done because no. the, the shark tokens will just be able to get them off the battlefield. That's right. You, you're basically trading Teferi for a shark plus a little bit of life. And for five mana in a format as powerful as historic, that is not going to get the job done. Or you could, uh, you know, Marshall, you can do the other thing. No, I'm not even, nope. I, I, not nope. even me, not even me this time. <laughs> not, not, not even me, veto. You don't think that's a good play? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I am not a proponent of this line of play. And normally I would be, and you know it, but uh, we, we can't get there. And this one it looks like the mana stumble for John Wolf is going to be supremely punishing here as where does he go from here, right? He could, like, we could, he could do what we said cast it to fairy but i think that john knows what's up you know he's looking at brad with five cards in hand just passing the turn every turn and it's like i can see a pattern here it has been shark typhoon on my hand step every time and it's not unlikely to see another one here now there is a world where john just says i just have to take my medicine run out to fairy minus it on your three three shark and say go and perhaps that keeps him alive long enough to, to get this Drake Haven down or start doing other things. But boy, what an uncomfortable position to be in. Yeah, I mean, John is not really in a position right now to play around anything, right? right. And this is why Shark Typhoon is so powerful against control decks because it kind of puts the onus on them to be able to interact or rather react with the pressure that you're putting on them. And so now John just has to start running things out. That's right. And and it looks like he went for the Drake even there instead of the Teferi. I don't know. I I, I almost wanted to, I almost considered just think, just playing Teferi there instead. It mm -hmm. is just a more powerful option. And really, I mean, if your opponent has a counterspell, so be it. You're already behind here. And Teferi might be the card that kind of can get you back into the game. Where at Drake even, I mean, sure, you can make some tokens, but it does it does tax your mana pretty heavily. It really does. This is, uh, is going to be cycle, lonely sandbar, and then do some... Some, some type of blocking to make sure that your life total stays high enough and then try to resolve it to fairy. But boy, going back to what you said about Shark Typhoon, not that we need to talk about how good of a card it is. I mean, people know, but when you really break it down to like the fundamentals, it's ridiculous, right? Like Brad has been able to resolve three threats in a row that drew him cards and John had four counter spells in hand at one point and two of them were hard counters and two of them were, were you know, negate style effects with the vetoes, but none of them did anything. I, that's just absurd. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it is it is just one of the best possible cards in matchups like this. And I mean, this is the reason why whenever when you do see these Sultai decks, they do they board into four copies of Shark Typhoon, specifically for matchups like this. This is where it really, really shines. And it sure has. It's just made life so difficult for John trying to maneuver around these. Now, you don't always draw three copies of it if you're sitting in Brad Nelson's seat, but boy, it has looked amazing. Now we're going to see Uro come out of the hand here and just a little, little temporary stay on the battlefield. But boy, down to three with no board whatsoever here is John Wolf. He's leaning on that Drake Haven very hard, and now it's it's too late for the Teferis. 
Yeah, no, that's it. And then Brad also just, just for good measure, in case John may have had a wrath of God or something up his sleeve, now has the negate to counteract that as well. Beautiful stuff here for Brad Nelson. That sideboard plan working wonderfully for him, stranding two copies of Dovin's Veto in hand here in game three for John Rolfe, forcing him to awkwardly cycle away his neutralizes. Those don't find any targets either. And now John's best play is to cycle Hieroglyphic Illumination to make a 2-2 Drake and hope to be able to do that two more times this turn just to not die. Yeah, so uh, I know in the previous the match... I know in the previous match, we were talking about how uh, Andrea Mangucci, is, uh, you, you would expect him to play some kind of mid-range deck. Well, before Andrea Mangucci, it was Brad Nelson, right? He was